Welcome to the Soulful CXO, where we discuss leadership principles, core values, health, wellness, and resiliency. I'm Dr. Rebecca Wynn, the founder and the host of the show. Do you have a topic or guest you would like to be featured on the show? Would you like to be a sponsor? Please reach out to me on LinkedIn or email me at Rebecca at SoulfulCXO.com. Please go to our partner, Cybersecurity Tribe, for weekly show recaps and other resources. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Soulful CXO. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Wynn. Joining us today is Diana Kelly, the Chief Strategy Officer, Chief Security Officer, and Co-Founder of Cybreys. She serves on the boards of Cyber Future Foundation, WESIS, and the Executive Women's Forum. Prior roles include being the cybersecurity field CTO for Microsoft, but we first met because we did the CISO Stressbuster series together. The Global Executive Security Advisor at IBM, GM at Symantec, VP at Burton Group, now Gardner Manager at GPMG, CTO, co-founder of Security Curve, and many other positions. Her extensive professional volunteering includes serving the ACM Ethics and Plagiarism Committee, CompTIA Cybersecurity Committee, RSAC U.S. Program Committee, and Executive Board Member of the Cyber Future Foundation. She is sought after keynote speaker and lecturer, is the host of Bright Talks, The Security Balancing Act, co-author of books, Practical Cybersecurity Architecture, and Cryptographic Libraries for Developers, named EF. F, 2020 Executive of the Year, and one of Cybersecurity Adventures, 100 Fascinating Females Fighting Cyber Crime. Diana, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. Diana, your background is so fascinating and very long, <laughs> and you do so much in the field for not only women, but other professionals, and obviously doing all your cybersecurity strategy and visa so and variety type work. But it's always really interesting to look back, like, how did we even start? When you went to Boston College, what did you what did you even study? What did you get your first degree in? And, and how did that lead you on this fascinating career? So it's a little deceptive if we start at Boston College. And the reason is I was an English major and I focused on, I particularly wanted to study Shakespearean English. So I, I loved Russian literature and Shakespeare. So once I was able to really focus down, those were the two areas I focused on the most when I got my my degree, my undergraduate degree in English literature. However, <laughs> well before that, when I was nine years old, my father brought home a programmable Texas Instruments calculator. And my brother's three years older than me. And I think he just thought because my brother was a little bit older, maybe my brother would be more interested. It was not gendered at all. It was very much about age. But my brother was like kind of mad on it. I was over the moon because I could program these little metal strips and they would do calculations and print things out. And I was like, this is amazing. So at that point, my dad's like, oh, I've got a, a, like a tech nerd in the family. So we built computers together. And then when uh, MIT, he was a research professor there at Lincoln Labs, MIT gave him an account for the DARPAnet and he found out he could get a student or, or guest account for me. So I'm 13 years old and I'm logging into the DARPAnet. I think there were like fewer systems on the whole DARPAnet at that point than most average people have in a house these days. But you know, were, it was amazing. It was a bunch of PDP 10s and 11s that were linked together. And I could go in through MIT Tech Square. And I, it was when I say go in, I mean, I sat there with a the literal rotary dial phone, put it into a modem coupler, you know, could you hear, wait for the screech, put it into the modem. So it's dinosaur time for a lot of people <laughs> this. But, and if you can imagine, it's the late seventies and now it's all amber screen, but I am sitting there in my parents' basement and I can talk to people in California. I can talk to people down in DC. I can get to these other systems. We can play games. There was email, there was instant messaging. And I was just, this is the future. Absolutely convinced it was the future. And I wanted to learn more about it. And ultimately I did. I, I learned more about it. I also found there was a password vulnerability. I may have super used improperly. It's all been squared away. I was, it, again, a 13 year old would not have the plausible deniability, but in, in the late seventies, this was all very, so it's all, it's all squared. I did not hack anything. I just found a, a vuln and was not sure of the rules. They told me the rules very quickly and I followed them ever since. But I just really, I just wanted to learn. I wanted to learn how these systems worked. I, I felt it was the future. So, and at that point, you really had to teach yourself how to code 
even to work on systems. It's we're all used to, you know, I hear people say, oh, my five-year-old child is so much smarter than me with computers. But when everything's graphical, it's very different than even back then. It wasn't just command line, but it, you kind of had to know how to write code to do anything on the systems at all. So I just, I fell absolutely in love, taught myself. I was writing, I wrote a couple of games and and then I went to college and I realized that there wasn't a whole lot there that I was as interested in because I had taught myself so much. I also wasn't sure what kind of career was gonna come out. Cause again, this is, this is the early eighties and what kind of career you would have in computers. It's not like now where it's like, everybody's like, every, tech is the place to go. I wasn't sure. So I graduated, got this English degree. I immediately try and go work in publishing because I figured that's where English, you know, I wanted to be an editor. I was the go-to computer guy at every job I had. Every, that was it. I went from job to job and I was in editorial working my way up, but I was always the go-to computer person until I was at a textbook company. And we needed to have software to accompany the textbooks. And they said, hey, Diana, you're the, basically you're the computer guy of this company. You do the acquisitions for the software, and then you train the sales reps on how they can train the, the, the teachers and professors to use this new software. It was kind of exciting to have software with books back then. So I was like, okay. And as I'm doing this, the head of our parent company, which was in California, saw me doing a presentation and training the sales team on how to use the software and why the software is important. She said, look, we're tying all the different subsidiaries together so we can have the power of spend and buy paper in bulk. But that means that we're going to get S400s around the company and some and some of the divisions aren't going to get the AS400. So we're, they're going to have to get LinkedIn. But so there's going to be networking, there's going to be training, there's a whole lot of stuff coming. I think you're the, the person to do it. And I was like, I don't. I don't mean, you know, I don't know, because I had not thought of it as a professional career and, and so blessed by Jennifer seeing that in me and Jennifer said, I think you are, I have faith in you. I was very lucky that the editors I worked for said, you can come back if this doesn't work out. And I started the job, you know, to help do this massive transformation project. I never looked back. I was like, what am I even doing in editorial? This is obviously where I belong. I love being in tech. And another interesting thing was that I, I mentioned the person who was my boss who, who hired me and saw that. Her name was Jennifer. Her boss, who was the CIO of our parent company, was also a woman. So I'm in this very strange situation where I'm thinking, I guess tech and computers is where, you know, it's very, it's open and women can are thriving here in this profession. It wasn't until years later when I had then realized I kept being in rooms that were all male, except for me, that I started to realize, Oh, I was in a very unique situation, but I'm just so grateful, not just for what Jennifer did for me as a mentor. I mean, that is, that's advocacy, that's mentorship. She, I, I owe my entire career and my life in some part, you know, of, to my professional life, to her support. And that's one of the reasons that I work so hard to try and be that person for other people. Cause I know that what she did for me was life changing. That's interesting. My, my first major job at NCI information systems doing government work end up having a program manager, which, you know, those are billion dollar project was a female. Yeah. My yeah. first information assurance, true manager was a female who was a rock star. And then the government person who was doing all my report reading, who was very tough on me, but was a man was a, a guru, fair. guru, Deb Harvey down, who's still down in Fort Huachuca down there in seventh. She still is a security engineer of a security engineer of a security engineer. And having those three women was early in my career yeah. was very helpful. And like, it's like I don't see them very often unless I I run into them that we're speaking together or, or doing some sort of project together out in the other world. It's it's usually like you said, it's a men's world. Yeah. But that, what what challenges do you do you see with women in technology? I still see it as a struggle. I see it as a struggle not only on us getting to the ceiling, but I I've also gone ahead. I know I talked to you a little bit offline, where you know, kind of like the piranha people, women. I was going to say underneath you kind of like clawing at your heels and not playing very nicely. What, what do you see? Cause I know you do a lot with, with a lot of the younger generation as well. Yeah. And I mean, I'm really lucky to be part of the two organizations you mentioned earlier, EWF, the executive women's forum, which is all about creating a sisterhood of support and WESIS, which is women in cybersecurity. And that's all about recruiting, retraining and advancing women in cybersecurity. And both of those communities, I think, are really good for helping women be supportive, networking and giving each other opportunities to advance. And fortunately, it still actually does our 
security and technology do still tend to skew a little bit male. I ha- and I have been talking to some folks who are in school and, and sort of rising up. And sometimes, you know, women are saying, I'm not sure there's a future in me, future for me in cyber. I don't know if I belong in cyber. And I think that it's just, we just have to continue to be out there. People like you, like me, you know, we're modeling that, yes, women belong in cyber. <laughs> you know, EWF and WESIS are modeling. Women absolutely belong in cyber. We belong here as leaders. And I think it's just continuing to advance that and promote that. And, you know, to your point, it, when somebody, when resources get scarce or people get frightened, they can start to lash out at each other. It's a you know, sort of a natural tendency, but I think that it's, not the way that systems ultimately grow and thrive. So when when somebody is being negative or toxic, I think it's really important, you know, especially for management leaders as much as possible, to go in and address that because you know we can we can spend a lot of time ripping each other apart and keeping ourselves down, but we're going to move a lot faster and go a lot farther when we work together and lift each other up. When you are doing a lot of the teaching, I know you lecture a lot of different universities, and you have you know, courses and stuff that are out there. What do you find is the biggest challenges with the younger generation? I know I've said this publicly. I think the critical thinking skills, which we have already talked about a little earlier. I was a math lead chem major. So I learned how to to really get in and figure it out and do things by hand. And I see that as a big gap. What do you see as the gaps? Well, I mean, the critical thinking, Rebecca, is just that's such a big, it's such a big one. Because, you know, a lot of times it's like, what, what did you study undergrad? Most people, if they got a good liberal arts education, what you learned was how to learn. You know, you became a good student because when you graduate, you've got just what was available to the time you graduate. So be ready for decades and decades, the whole rest of your life, you have to learn. So I think that, you know, being able to learn critical thinking, very important. I hope that that's still being taught in universities. I've read that there's really a push towards because STEM is so we've pushed for so long on STEM, STEM, STEM and and, and getting more women into STEM. But If we don't have sociology and literature and history, I think that we are going to lose some of that critical thinking. And right now, one of the things that's really bothering me or worrying me the most about that lack of critical thinking is our good old friend, sorry to buzzword you on this one, but bringing in chat GPT here and the generative AI, because the reality is that when you get the classic essay, right, and I'm going to use the great gats because that tends to be one of the most common ones. If there's in this book, if, if for anybody that hasn't read it, there's a light, a green light at the end of one of the character, Daisy Buchanan's, and it's across from another character, Jay Gatsby. And it really symbolizes capitalism and wealth and all these things that Jay reaches for and wants, but ultimately doesn't get in the, in the book. So it's very poignant and it's very meaningful. And you can interpret that green light in many different ways. But so many essays have been written on this topic that if you go to chat GPT and ask it to write an essay, and I've done this because I was curious, it'll write you a pretty solid B essay on the green light and, and Great Gatsby. But you wouldn't have learned anything. You wouldn't have learned the ability to read the book, get the different clues, think for yourself, add your own viewpoint and perspective, and then come out with something that's very you, but original. And also that that understands what's in there. So I, I, I fear that critical thinking, we've pushed everybody into STEM, which is great, but we also need to have more of the liberal arts, I think, to bring in. And now I do worry that we're going to denigrate that even more with things like AI. So I really, really hope that we can continue because there's nothing, the the freedom to have your mind and be able to understand how to get reputable sources, do research and, and do your own analysis is just priceless. And I think we need to support more of that. I agree. And I think, I think it's a healthy fear on a lot of information security analysts out there, engineers who are saying, hey, AI, the machine learning is actually going to put me out of business. I'll tell you, AI has been around since 1950. Machine learning actually came around actually 10 years later than that, 1960s. So it's not new. But if you do not practice in what is the so what, what does it mean for the enterprise risk? AI has to learn from you what that really means at so what. And so if you're not thinking that way, your job is going to be on the line. But, you know, it is a fearful time right now. How do you go ahead when you are teaching people, hey, AI machine learning is our friends. Here's the basics. This is how you can use it for good versus evil. 
How do you try to comfort them in all your different areas about embrace it in the ways it needs to be embraced? Don't fear to necessarily take over your job because we have a lot of that that fear going on in, in cybersecurity right now as well. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime that I, I teach others, I try to go from the, the platform of or the point of view that once we understand something, it's going to become less scary you know, lightning up in the sky was pretty scary. And, you know, there were stories created around it. Oh, it's Thor and his hammer and he's shaking his hammer. And then eventually science helped us understand what was really happening with lightning. And it's still to be a little feared because if you get hit by lightning, (laughs) it's dangerous, but we understand the, the mechanics and what's going on. And so it makes it a little less fearful for people. So that's what I try and do when I teach. I think a lot of technology, it can be very scary. It can be hard to, to comprehend. Certainly when we get into AI and ML, we're going into some really deep spaces technically that a lot of people haven't gone before and it can feel a little magical. You know, I often say it's not magic, it's math, but it feels a little, you know, magical. And you could even see that with some of the journalists who were interacting with the AI chatbots. They kept sort of feeding them things that were going to come back as this more personal. They're leading the AI that I want you to say something more personal. And so it did come out more personal. And then that feels very, you know, scary. I mean, you may, I I love the point you made about the 50s and 60s because Eliza, which was the MIT AI, for was the '60s, and there was fear, a lot of fear back then that you know the, it was we were going to get taken over by machines. So I think bringing it back down to earth, helping people to understand it, explaining to them about what these systems really are, instead of a lot of scary or even hard to comprehend multisyllabic, you know, very technical points. I just try and be as very clear as possible with people about what these systems are, and then also bring up the point, you know, as far as taking jobs away. If you look over the history of humanity, jobs arise and fall based on context and availability. One example I use is the farrier. This was actually a a job that was very, very popular over a hundred years ago. And a farrier is the person who takes care of the horse's hooves and shoes the horses. They're the horseshoer. So you can imagine that 150, 200 years ago, the person who's putting shoes on a horse is really, really important in an area because those horses are the main, that's how you're carrying things. That's how you're getting around. Now, farriers are far less in demand for obvious reasons, but it doesn't mean that there are no jobs. It's just that job went away. And with computers, we saw that Sure, jobs got taken away, but jobs got added. You know, now we do a lot of care and feeding of computers. The rise of the CISO, right, to make sure that the security of these systems and conversations and data is, are being protected properly. So I think we're going to see some of that shift with AI and ML too. While some tasks and jobs will be automated, and I hope that we really focus on automating the ones that are the most painful for human beings, like repetitive robotics. We've already seen that on on shop floor. But what about if we had a smart AI jackhammer? Instead of a person having to put all that stress on their body, the jackhammer could do the work. You know, so I hope we really focus on that. We've already done that with things like bomb, bomb robots. Instead of a person having to go in and see if there's a bomb, we can send a robot in. So I hope that you know we continue to focus on replacing jobs that humans don't really want to do and aren't unsafe for us. And then also some of the jobs that we're doing that are repetitive that maybe a, a system could do more easily than we can, like looking for massive patterns and massive amounts of data, but there are going to be jobs about us making sure that that system's not drifting towards bias. It's still operating. It's expected that it's getting the electricity and the, the system can support that it needs. So I think that, yeah, job, there will some be some jobs that go away, but there will be jobs that, that are created by this too. It's interesting just how you, you start out in English. I write a lot as well too. Sometimes it's because I'm forced because no one else writes and then people... <laughs> People ping us like, you guys must be the policy people or your government's risk and compliance solely just because you pay attention to this type of stuff. The one thing that concerns me a little bit with all this AI and stuff like that is the same thing when we have these templates on policies and procedures. I'm one of those people who, nope, don't do that to me if I'm actually your assessor. I will read every word and I will see your incongruencies. I will go ahead and read your strategies and I will go, your strategy matches 25 other people's strategies out there. So the one thing I always conscious people is if they go ahead and do it solely to be a checkbox that we have something written, 
you know, people like you and I are going to cut that and it's not going to work. So that's the one thing that I'm worried about. That is one thing to kind of play around a little bit going, hey, is there a more clear way to say this, this statement that I'm not thinking about for a variety of audience, but it's my statement. Give me yeah. some six or nine other ways. And, you're like, and you and I would go, oh, yeah, OK, I'll say it then this way. And then we tweak off of it. It's using it responsibly. You know. I love that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I joke that policies are really like fruitcakes. They keep getting passed around. But at some point, to you know, as you said, it, use a template. That's fine. Actually, ChatGPT could give you a template, but read every word and edit it and update it and make sure that it's not. It's a wonderful starting point. But yet you have to make it your company's policy, because when the assessor comes in, we know the assessor's going to go read the policy. Are you doing this, this and this? And if you're not, well, that's deficiency. Yeah, we won't go into it in this podcast, but just to remind our audience out there, there's a liability that goes along with the chat as well, too. And it's it's intellectual property that someone else's. It doesn't ask you whose property it is. It just gives you an interpretation of that. So be very careful of that. In, in well. open source, too, I've, I've heard back from colleagues in the we're very active in the open source community that some of the code that ChatGPT is presenting is actually under certain licenses. And because the people that get the code don't know it's under license, they're now misusing it. So, yeah, great, great point. Yeah, I've had two companies reach out to me personally because people went ahead with our LinkedIn and stuff like that. The stuff that is public out there, they're like, yeah. Rebecca they literally just gave us your resume again. Again, they're taking direct action against those people. Um, I didn't have to, they just needed my statement that they could do that. But that's the other thing to watch out for people like that. That I think the reason why that's important is we talk about people in career and fear and resiliency, you know, people out there who are HR, or if you are hiring people, there could be people who are getting through initial screening because their resumes are now written better by using a lot of these AI chatbots and they are targeting using target words, even though that person doesn't necessarily have the background. It could be your background, my background, Jim Ross background, Teresa Payton's background, other people's backgrounds. And because they spent the time to do that kind of targeting, those are the people out of, I got a thousand resumes, 200 resumes who are then in those final talks, but they're really impersonating. So need to really be careful of that. I'm seeing a lot more of that in the last couple of months. How, have you been seeing that too? And if so, how do you advise people who are hiring great staff not to fall in the trap? I know one, I always take a look at, I want to see all the resumes you threw out. That's what I want to go ahead and look at. <laughs> it's what I usually do. I have dealt with a lot of people that have been pretty beaten up. I mean, tra- I would say, you know, almost traumatized by the ATS, the applicant tracking systems, where, you know, no ma- it feels like no matter what they do to their resumes, they're getting rejected, getting rejected, even for jobs that they're in very good stead for. So, you know, I mean, look, use, there are tools that can help prepare it for ATS. Obviously, you never want to lie on your resume. You know, don't oversell. Someone's going to find it. You're going to end up being that dog in the meme, you know, the sheep dog that's surrounded by the sheep. You know, eventually they're going to figure out you didn't have the, the, the skills you said you did. But the other thing, in addition to that, is I, networking, people. That's really join communities, get involved, you know, something... EWF, we said, get involved, get involved with people, go to conferences like RSA or Black Hat, speak with other people, reach out on LinkedIn, because very often the way that you're going to get the really good job is going to be through networking. And it may not be, some people will say, but, you know, I've asked everybody I know in your, in my group. It's okay. It's probably not going to be in your initial group. It's going to be somebody they know or somebody that somebody they know knows. But so you say, you keep checking in and saying, I'm looking, this is the kind of thing I'm interested in. And the power of the network can really help um, to get past because those ATS systems can be just really hard. To, and they're, from what you're saying, Rebecca, it's going to be even harder if everybody's just optimizing to get past it and not even telling the truth. Yeah. And just, again, I actually applied for a position a few weeks ago and then I got the standard like letter back. And then an executive recruiter called me, well, got through me on LinkedIn and said, Hey, Rebecca, we have this position. We really want to talk to you. And I'm like, I will talk to you, but by the way, your automatic rejection letter rejected me three weeks ago. And I'm in final talks with them. We'll see where it goes, but that was funny, but it's one of those cases where 
you know, one door might close, go another. And sometimes I'll reach out to HR and in places along those lines. One little point, just because you're on LinkedIn, I, I write mentor people all the time. I said, guys, do not use the open to work, please. I'm looking for a job. I'm out of a job. I tell you, to me, it does not play well. You can go ahead and behind the scenes, you can say, hey, recruiters, I am open to that conversation and talk to your network privately. But I that circle around your head that says, to me, it gives the impression like, no one will hire me, please hire me. I have not seen that play well for many, many people. It plays to me the wrong statement. It's okay if you left a job, for whatever reason you left the job, you're on to your next chapter, which you will be okay and you will be better off. So play more to your strengths and the positivity about getting to the next chapter versus, oh, for me, hire me, here's my resume, spray and pray on LinkedIn. I don't think that's playing very well. What do you, what do you advise people on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do find that the I know people who submit in the resume through LinkedIn and, and it, it never, it almost never works out. The, I really wish open to work would work. You know, especially right now, we've seen massive layoffs in the tech industry. There are a lot of people that are out there looking. That should be an easy way to say, hey, I happen to be looking right now. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll take any job, just I happen to be available and I am looking for the next challenging role. So I, I really wish so much that that's what it was because that's how it's intended. But unfortunately, I do agree with you that I have heard back from a hiring manager saying it makes people look desperate, which I think is it that really makes me sad because the whole purpose is, look, you want to hire. This person says they're looking. It seems like I'm perfect. Why doesn't that work? But unfortunately, human nature kind of kicks in. And, and uh, yeah, I have heard some recruiting managers say that they don't want to they don't want somebody who's got that on, which I find really sad. But it looks desperate or like. Here's my resume. Please read it. You know, it's like a you know, tiny resume to the end of a dog's tail and letting them run around the neighborhood. Maybe I'll come back with, with an offer. I tell people you can behind the scenes. There's actually instead the dot where it says, let recruiters know and other people who are looking this way that I'm open to listen to opportunities. That's fine. But I think the the other part, it's like taking a billboard out and just saying, please hire me. Not saying that's their intention. They're great people. I'm just saying, like you said, it's better than networking through you know, different groups that you're on, you know, there's different LinkedIn groups and stuff like that, that you can go say, Hey guys, I'm looking for, you know, great opportunity. If you know one, I think that's always a better way to go. And I have to say, when I see the green light, I personally don't take it as, but I see it as just this person wants to get the next job, but yeah. But right, right here, we just said 50% are going to turn you off. So maybe think of another, another way. You know, our time is running short and it's been really great talking to you. How does the audience go ahead and get a hold of you for services or if they want to hire you to do a keynote speak or something <laughs> like that? How's the best way to reach out? Yeah, hit, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm Diana Kelly with an EY, at the extra E. And yeah, I'm always, I, I keep up to date with my, my messages. So please reach out. Well, Diana, as always, you are a soulful. CXO. Thank you.